I've gotten a lot of calls lately uh, and messages about the loss of control accident at Oshkosh here at 23. And uh, today in Flywire, I'm going to look at that. Um, this is a real tragedy for the families, for the Warbird community, and for the general public pilots all over. Uh, stick with me on Flywire. Hi, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flywire, I want to look into that accident of the AT6D49661 about five minutes after takeoff from Oshkosh. Oshkosh. My accident reviews are uh, never about the pilot per se. In each uh, instance, the mistakes that uh, led to the accidents are ones that I think each of us could make, uh, depending. So I think we owe the pilot and we owe the passenger as well as the families involved of this accident an unbiased look into what happened and how we can possibly prevent uh, the next accident like it. And that's the whole reason for an accident review. Uh, it is controversial. Anytime uh, I do an accident review, most of them are fatals. Uh, some will like it, others will not, and we all make mistakes. And I think this, this one actually breaks my heart. The pilot is the same age as my youngest daughter, who's a pilot. You may have seen her in the learning the spin, the spin video I did with her uh, in the past. Um, anyway. Okay, as always, I'm going to take a deep dive into this accident from a database perspective. Okay, I'm not going to do a whole lot of speculation here. There's a good ADSD, ADSB data and several eyewitnesses, and I expect the NTSB will provide some important background information with the preliminary report, which is not due out for a while. But uh, the final, we won't, it won't even see the light of day for two or three years. So that's not going to do much to help prevent accidents in the, in the near term. Hardly anybody reads the final reports. Uh, first off, I, want, I assume this was a local ride flight uh, for the passenger, given several factors uh, I'm not going to go into. It took off from Oshkosh, runway 27 at uh, 0900 ish. This is uh, the overall track of the flight right here. The first thing that caught my eye was the takeoff profile, and I think it's important to take a look at this. Okay, so let's look at this. Uh, 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 NOTAM, the Oshkosh NOTAM for VFR departures. The graphic here shows a 90 degree heading uh, corridor for Oshkosh airspace and the note for runway 27 says that by flight heading 270 to 360 at or below 1300 until clear of Class D airspace. It's pretty clear. The reason for this is to separate traffic inbound from Fisk along the railroad track at 1800 feet and uh, they're, they're going to the quarry, just west, uh, just east of the Highway 41. From there, the aircraft join the downwind, and those on the high entry will descend down to 1800. And I've even seen slower airplanes, like Cubs and so on, descend down to, uh, because eight, a thousand foot pattern is a bit too high. So there's a lot of uh, movement that quarry is a busy, busy place, and you can't be sure of what altitude people are gonna fly or exactly where. There's another traffic entry uh, straight in from the north for performance and, uh, and other administrative traffic that is not open to the general public, so it's commonly not known that it exists. Oh, and Camp Cupcraft Crafters is based at a small airport just on the inside of Oshkosh Class D, where, where there's a lot of low-level flying going on at odd times. Not sure exactly how high they get there. Uh, it's pretty cool if you have a chance to go. The bottom line is Oshkosh is a very busy airspace and the NOTAM is an attempt de to deconflict traffic procedurally since there's no time for individual control. There are just too many airplanes, so it has to be procedural and that means you have to stick to it. Now let's look at uh, 961's flight plan. The airplane begins an immediate right turn and a rapid climb, flying right over the quarry at 1400 feet and then climbing and continuing to climb. It reaches about 1,600 feet just beyond the National Guard on the other side of the quarry. It well within runway 27 downwind flying area. And then it proceeded north along 41 on the east side of it, reaching the Fox River Bridge. It turned to the northeast and continuing to climb uh, profile. Uh, flying less than a mile from Camp Cub Crafters. I didn't put a, a mic on it, so I can't say exactly how far it was. Uh, they've, they, uh, 
follow the railroad track. He paid sort of the link north, jink at the railroad tracks, jink north for about 15 seconds and then proceeded eastbound. That got it outside the Class D airspace for the first time in the flight. Uh, and uh, that was just east of Camp Cupcrafters. Up until this point, the airplane was maneuvering totally within the uh, Oshkosh Class D airspace. Not talking to anybody, not cleared for, for that kind of operation. It's still the towered airspace. I don't necessarily think this is a takeoff profile that's particularly to, to the pilot or has anything to do with this accident, but it is a serious situation and I think it likely that a lot of folks flying local sorties follow a similar path. But I have to note that the only effective traffic deconfliction at Oshkosh is procedural. Follow the NOTAM and it would only add a few minutes to your flight time, but it's a deconfliction parameter that I think we should all meet. And uh, you're not going to see the guy that hits you. The climbing, the climb continued uh, over the lake to approximately 3,800 feet, and at approximately 9:05, the airplane turned to a southerly heading, and it appears to begin some sort of maneuvering. Without witnesses, I can't tell exactly what. Perhaps a, a slow speed aileron roll. The speed was slow, or even a snap roll. The entry speed of this uh, was commensurate with a snap speed and the overall 70 degree uh, heading change here is in, in 15 seconds and a swing of nearly 700 feet per minute in the vertical. That's not normal, something happened here. The airplane rolls out and uh, can, uh, about 0915, uh, 0515 heading 103 degrees and heading to about 200 feet per minute climb. Well, can, one second later it's turned 20 degrees and is now climbing at 450 feet per minute with no change in speed. And that is a very rapid roll and uh, pull right in a T6. The important point in this is that two seconds later, it has turned right another 18 degrees, slowed 10 knots, and now is descending 4,000 feet. The next ADSB hit is the exact same parameters. I've seen this before, this kind of behavior before in ADSB hits, recording when the airplane goes upside down. In other words, it just transmit data in the cache, but it doesn't transmit new data. And then it's gonna clear the cache and you get a dropout if you spend much time upside down. That didn't happen here, we just have that one double hit. So it looks like an upside down to me. Four seconds after, uh, at uh, 23 seconds, five minutes and 23 seconds, the airplane uh, is back to a 084 heading and at a very slow speed and descent rate is uh, 10,048 feet per minute. That hard right roll and pull maneuver at 515 uh, resulted in a stall that developed into a spin. I'm pretty sure and uh, there doesn't appear to be any attempt to recover from it or at least any successful one. It appears to me that the spin was to the right and one second before the airplane had turned in one second, another second it had turned 10, 18 degrees and posted a 9,300 feet per minute descent rate. And the next second, it turned just over 350 degrees, posting a descent rate of 7,700 feet per minute. That's a spin, folks. And has accelerated about 21 knots. The second ADSB data hit here is a repeat, presumably upside down again, which uh, happens in a, in a departure. You're gonna get a pretty steep pit. The next ADSB hit is 10 seconds later at 9.05, uh, and, and having lost 1,700 feet, now descending at 11,500 feet per minute, heading roughly through the south with the ground speed representing a nearly vertical flight path. Okay, this was the last ADSB hit. The ground speed is 19 knots, but you know it's not doing that. Witness reported the airplane, witnesses reported the airplane impacting the water in a, in a spiral, and given that ADSB data, I think it's safe to say that this was a stall spin incident and no recovery uh, was affected. I've owned two T6s in the past. I love the airplane. It's a, a, a delight to fly uh, in the air, on the ground handling, it's a bear, and it has a wicked stall break. Most airplanes break hard to the right, most T6s break hard to the right with a big wing drop. Okay, so if you haven't played with a stall, it's a problem. It's a heavy airplane weighing in at over 5,000 pounds, and inertia is a very real thing in flying a T6. In World War II, as a trainer for the Army Air Force, it was the advanced trainer for the Army Air Force and the Navy, as well, other, well as other allied forces, and it is known as the pilot maker, probably because it's not easy to master. In World War II, the services spun it uh, in the training syllabus all the time, but there's cautions and there's notes on it. 
what, after World War II, the FAA grandfathered the airplane with a standard type rating, uh, and with the exception of spins. For the FAA, the requirement is to recover from a one-turn spin within one turn. Recall that the technical definition of a spin is the first one to two turns of a departure is the incipient phase, and that depends on the particular airplane. And then the spin is, the spin is not fully developed here until the second or third turn, again, depending on the airplane. So the first turn is incipient. The T6 has a tendency to accelerate yaw rate during a fully developed spin recovery, okay? Much like, much like a, uh, an ice skater who does, I think it's called an axle, where they bring their arms in and they speed up. This is conservation of momentum. It's a physics thing. Remember what I said about uh, inertia. It will recover from a spin using normal spin recovery inputs in about one and a half turns. And that acceleration is kind of uh, daunting, okay? And sometimes people let go. This is not enough for the FAA, so fully developed spins are not legal to do. So what's the result is hardly anyone does them, not even in, in the sipping phase. Moreover, I want to venture that probably the number of full stalls done by active T6 pilots would be surprisingly low, okay? So how many have actually seen that hard stall and break? The pilot in this case was a very low time pilot. No offense there, based on this accident, I would say she also didn't have familiarity with stalls and spins. She wasn't prepared for that situation. The T6 has a wicked stall break, and if you've never seen it before, your chances of recovering grow slim. It will progress to a full blown departure at, 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 in the blink of an eye. This all happens in, for, in less than a second, <laughs> basically. The proper maneuver is a spin prevent, and when you notice the nose slice, unload and use rudder to correct the slice. That's gonna be in my video, and I'll have it linked down below uh, about spinning the T6. The other thing I've heard is, uh, as a result of this accident, is that a lot of commentators say that, uh, that the T6 is really re easily recovered from a spin at 3,000 feet. And I'll say, I'm sorry, I'm gonna call BS on that. As you can see from the descent rates in this accident, you have one chance at 3,000 feet AGL from recovering from that at, at altitude. And if you don't do it right, you're screwed, okay? So you're, you're gonna impact the ground. I do spins above 6,000, probably about eight. And uh, in my in minimum, my view, it, that's minimum in my view. And in World War II, they used 10,000 feet to start a spin. So what does that tell you? Speed alone will not save your life. I think that whole DMMS idea is a great idea, but it is not a, a panacea. Stalls happen at slow speed. Stalls happen at any speed, and they occur at a critical angle of attack at any speed. You have to have uh, experience to recognize that stall and then know how to prevent the spin. And that really applies to any airplanes, but the T6, it's a big deal. It's obvious that uh, this pilot loved aviation and loved to share it. It's a tragedy that she encountered a situation that she was unprepared for. It just breaks my heart. A rigorous training program is a lifesaver. And serious, and you gotta get serious about your training and practice your skill set. Please know how to do a spin prevent. That is the number one thing here. I'm gonna leave a link below, as I said, to my T6 spin video and uh, it'll take you right to that chapter so you don't have to watch the rest of the video if you don't want to. If you like the video, hit like and subscribe. It looks a bit like this here. And I'd like to thank my uh, Patreon supporters here as well. Uh, and there'll be a link below uh, if you'd like to support the channel on Patreon. Well, there you have it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time on Flywire.